Welcome to today's session of Speaking Out About History, the SAR series of author interviews. Today, we will be hearing about a new book, African Founders, by Pulitzer Prize winning author David Hackett Fisher. Dr. Fisher will be answering questions presented by compatriots of the organization, the National Society of Sons of the American Revolution. Dr. David Hackett Fisher was born December 2nd, 1935 in Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, he is uh, an American educator and historian whose books on American and comparative history combine academic rigor with popular accessibility. His works focus not only on great individuals, but also on the society and the people behind the wider movements that inform those individuals' accomplishments. David grew up in Baltimore, received a bachelor's degree from Princeton University and a PhD in history from Johns Hopkins University. Upon graduation, he had offers for tenure track positions from a number of prestigious universities, but chose the relatively newly established Brandeis University. Aside from occasionally visiting professorships at other institutions, he has remained at Brandeis for the duration of his academic career. His first book, The Revolution of American Conservatism, The Federalist Party in the Area of, Era of Jeffersonian Democracy, 1965, examined the middle and later years of the party and bore features that would continue to appear in his work, a strongly argued point of view and a revisionist approach when warranted with special attention given to the zeitgeist and the concerns of the populace. Historians' fallacies took a critical look at historiography. Already a solidly respected scholar among historians, Fisher broke through to a wider readership with Albion Seed, or British Folkways in America, on the assimilation of British regional cultures in colonial America. Washington's Crossing, 2004, was a study of the American Revolution with special focus on George Washington's 1776 crossing of the Delaware River to attack the British troops at Trenton, New Jersey. It became a popular bestseller and won the 2005 Pulitzer Prize for History. In 2015, David won the Pritzker Military Museum and Library Literature Award for Lifetime Achievement in Military Writing. David Hackett Fisher's African Founders, How Enslaved People Expanded American Ideals, is so much more than just a history of, of Africans in North America and slavery. It is an anthropologic and socioeconomic study of how each of the geographic regions and ethnically different regions of North America were settled, how they developed and the role free and enslaved Africans played in that development. It is distinctly different in each region. And as you discover how and why, you'll also learn more about just how amazing it is that we were once able to put all of our regional differences aside, unite to fight a war against England for our independence, to develop a national identity and to form our own unique brand of a constitutional republic. Rest assured, the book is not just numbers, charts, and tables, although there's plenty of that. You'll also learn about many amazing people and their inspiring stories along the way. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. David Hackett Fisher, who is speaking to us today about his incredible new book. Dr. Fisher, the floor is yours. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, let me uh, begin by uh, uh, saying that um, I, um, uh, I graduated from, uh, uh, grad uh, from Johns Hopkins in 1962, and uh, I thought for a while um, that I would be unemployed. And then suddenly um, the baby boomers went to college. And within a few months, the offers began to pour in from I think I, I suddenly I had from no offers I, that I had nine schools uh, uh, that that offered uh, and one of them I came to visit, uh, which was Brandeis University, named after Louis Dembitz Brandeis, uh, and uh, it's an extraordinary place. It's a it's a small um, a, a liberal arts university of Jewish sponsorship. I am myself a card carrying Lutheran. Uh, and when I, I, I came there, I, I met two extraordinary people uh, uh, who uh, were the life and soul of the institution, followed by a third. The third was Abram Sacker, a historian who became who was the, the president of Brandeis and built this extraordinary place. And then Leonard Levy was one of uh, my senior colleagues. And John Roach, who later became the White House advisor uh, to several Democratic presidents and was uh, 
had had all, all these men had major careers. Uh, they uh, they uh, 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 Leonard won the first Pulitzer Prize uh, in the in the department, uh, followed by I think seven others uh, that that mm -hmm. came quickly to 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 uh, my my colleagues uh, in this ex ex extraordinary place. And I was encouraged to find my own way. And I was interested in how a free society. Uh, began to function in America. And I started that part of my quest in a book called Albion Seed, which was about different British cultures, different groups coming from Britain to different regions of America, four major regions in, in particular. Uh, and from there, I went on to the, the book I'm talking about today, to the African story about different groups of Africans who also came from different parts of Africa to different parts of the United States. And I'm of the school of history that was founded by Francis Parkman. And Francis Parkman said, the first rule in, in writing history is go there. The second rule is do it, and then think about writing it. And that's what I tried to do. So for this book on African founders, my wife, Judy, uh, and I uh, traveled to Africa. Uh, we did our homework first to find out where in Africa uh, American, uh, the, uh, American slaves came from. And we identified their regions and they cover a, a very large part of an enormous continent uh, and, and uh, absolutely fascinating to visit. It reaches from the bulge of West Africa down to this Southern boundary of Angola, uh, much of the Western uh, uh, edge of, of Africa. And we uh, uh, sought to go to as many parts of that area as we could. We were never able to get to Angola uh, in the period when I was writing the book because uh, a civil war was raging in Angola and the ground was littered with landmines. And we were advised that that was uh, not the time to go to Angola. We hope to get there at some time in the future. But we went to every other part of Africa from which um, uh, 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 slaves were, were brought in, in, into the uh, American colonies that became the, the United States. And, and what we found was once again, as with the European migrations, a story of diversity. We found that African cultures were very different one from another. And we tried to visit African, as many parts of that African coast as we could. And we tried also to get out of the cities, into the countryside, uh, getting into small towns and villages, meeting people, talking with them, uh, learning some of their own language so that we could talk as directly as, as possible. Uh, we always traveled uh, with two African companions. One was a driver who was often a, a soldier who was, uh, who was enlisted by the American Express Company to, to work for us. American Express arranged our our, our trips. Um, and then the other person was a translator, uh, usually an African woman, sometimes a man. And together there, we went uh, along the coast, looking and meeting and talking with people. And we found an amazing variety of cultures in Africa, uh, a mix of different European cultures with different African cultures. And we were fascinated by by the variety of the of what we discovered there, it was very much like our our, our the feeling of, of of surprise at how many different groups of British um, uh, uh, founders we had in America, and how profoundly different they were from one another. As Puritans were different from from Quakers, and uh, Quakers from uh, from from Virginia Cavaliers and Virginians from Carolinians and so forth and so on. And it was just that way in Africa. And I think that's, that in itself is one of the great fundamental facts of American history. I think it's our diversity that keeps us free. It is the richness and the complexity of this country uh, that is the best base for liberty and, and freedom. And I think uh, for some people in America regret our diversity I think we should embrace it. 
uh, and be, I think it's, it, it, it is, is the, the foundation of a free and open society. And I am um, in complete agreement with you that it's our diversity that is what makes the country strong. And I believe um, that is the nature of this country. It's the nature of uh, what has kept us um, free for all these years, keeps us unique and makes us a, a, a place that others want to come. Well, let me try to be... summarize the, the the pattern of diversity that I found in a in a in a in a, in a, in a minute or two. A uh, person who's so watching this has a copy of my book. He can see the architecture of it. He looks at the table of contents, uh, which is geographical, and it goes by region. And uh, let me summarize it very quickly. The first is the region of New England, and there we have the familiar Puritan purposes which most Americans knew well, but they met a group of slaves, of, of Africans who came mainly uh, from Nigeria, Ghana, in West Africa. Many of them were, were uh, 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 Aiken speaking, A-K-A-N, uh, speaking a family of languages in, 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 in West Africa. And these Aiken slaves mixed with Puritans to create a unique Afro-American culture in New England, in Puritan New England, uh, that was very different from, from, from every other region. And then something else happened in the Hudson Valley. Here, there were not British founders, but Dutch. And the Dutch West India Company um, had a major uh, link to another part of Africa, which was in Angola. And the great bulk of the slaves who came to Africa, to, to uh, the Hudson Valley, came from what is now Angola in the, on the southern uh, end of, that, of this long uh, African, uh, African uh, coast. Um, and uh, they created a unique um, uh, Afro-Dutch culture uh, that formed mainly in the Hudson Valley and then spread uh, to Long Island to East Jersey, people used to talk in early America about the Jerseys, West Jersey and East Jersey. And East Jersey was very much a part of the Hudson Valley. Uh, and then it reached into uh, the Southern edge of New England a little bit. And uh, that was, a, and still is, a very distinct and very diverse region, which we know most, uh, most Americans are clearly uh, aware of the character of New York. Uh, and greater New York that way. And then uh, south of that, uh, that uh, on the other side of, of, of the state of New Jersey is, uh, uh, is that another great region which centers on the Delaware Valley. It's the Valley of the Delaware River that flows between New Jersey and Pennsylvania uh, down into the Atlantic uh, Ocean and the northern part of the state of Delaware, that includes uh, large parts of, of, of three states, uh, of the, the most densely settled part of the, the, the great state of Pennsylvania is in this area. And the founders of the most important settlements in this region were Quakers. They weren't the first European settlers, but they were the most numerous. And they gave a distinct character to, not only to Pennsylvania, what most people know about Quaker origins, Pennsylvania, but equally so in West Jersey, and also in the northern part of Delaware. Delaware is divided into three counties in Newcastle County. The northern county is very much a part of all of this. And uh, these, uh, these Quakers uh, 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 traded with Africa, and they tended to trade with the upper part of the coast in the area that they called Guinea. Um, and it was a, it, it went through about four or five African states today, and along that coast, that Guinea coast, uh, was the were the, 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 the roots of the of, of the of the African population in in Delaware, and in all three of these areas, uh, it, 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 Africans came from every other part of Africa that participated in the slave trade, but there was always a dominant group. And the dominance was always different from one region to another. And then the next uh, uh, culture 
the fourth culture south of the Delaware Valley is the, it, or the, the, the colonies that were founded on the Chesapeake Bay, which was first Virginia and then Maryland. Uh, and uh, and they, they together created another region uh, that was the, the first uh, permanent English settlement in Jamestown in 1607. And then a generation later, the founding of Maryland by, uh, by English Catholics uh, in 1634. And uh, these uh, uh, were, Virginia became by far the largest of the first 13 states uh, when it, in, in the early Republic, it included all of West Virginia. Uh, and it was by far the, the, the biggest of the, of the states. And as a, 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 that partly explains why they produced uh, 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 four of the first five American presidents were all, were all Virginians. Um, and, and they had a, from Washington uh, and, 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 and Madison, and, and, and Jefferson, Madison, Monroe had a major uh, a, 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 a presence as leaders of the American of the American uh, Republic, and then beyond that is uh, coastal Carolina, running from North Carolina uh, through the Low Country of South Carolina, as it's called, the, the the eastern part of South Carolina that's closest to the Atlantic, and reaching into the northern corner of Florida, the northeastern corner of through Georgia to the northeastern corner of Florida. And um, all of that uh, I, I, I speak of as coastal Carolina, Georgia, Florida, as another distinctive region. And this was first settled by planters from Barbados in the West Indies. Uh, and uh, they uh, uh, recruited their uh, African slaves who were mostly, they were called Gullah and uh, Gullah slaves who came from Angola. Uh, and mixed with other slaves who were called Geechee slaves in, in Georgia. Uh, and uh, they predominated uh, the, the, there from, and, and came uh, mainly from, uh, from Angola and from West Africa, a mix of those combinations and, uh, and, and, and uh, shaped the, the African culture of that region. And then the last was the most diverse of all these regions, which was the Mississippi Valley, Louisiana, uh, Mississippi and the Gulf Coast. And these were French, Spanish, Anglo rulers, and they were very, very diverse. Uh, Bamana slaves, Benin slaves from what is now Benin, Congo slaves, all coming into New Orleans and then moving up the stream, up the, up Mississippi and settled, settling the lower Mississippi Valley. And then I have three other uh, 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 regions, which I won't talk about today. Uh, one of them was uh, where the, um, the Western frontiers, uh, which included the Texas Mustangers and, and others, they often uh, 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 brought in Fulani herders. Uh, these were Africans who had worked with large groups of animals uh, and, were, and, and, began, and were picked for that, for that purpose. And then there was another maritime frontier on the coast, which were West African boatmen, Atlantic seamen. Uh, they founded an American maritime tradition, which was a special way. And then finally, one last group, which was the a, a, a Southern frontier um, in Florida in particular. And uh, these were um, Angolan slaves mixing with Spanish at first, and then many other groups and, pr and producing um, a, 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 an Afro-Indian um, in, um, uh, European culture of U.S. Um, Seminole Negro uh, um, Africans working with Europeans as well. So nine American regions, and each of them had their own history, and uh, never twice the same. But all of them share something in common. Uh, they all, uh, even as all of them uh, kept slaves, only a handful of slaves in New England, and the majority of the population in the very uh, uh, or slaves in the in the, the most southern colonies, and then a gradient that goes all the way through. But uh, they were they were they all shared that diversity, 
And they also all believed in some ideas of liberty and freedom, but never twice the same. And by my, my, the, the companion volume of this, which is Albion Seed, is about different ideas of liberty and freedom that came to America in each of those regions. And I won't summarize them in detail here. Suffice to say that they were very different from the, the ordered freedom of New England, it's the New England, the freedom of New England towns to, to, to govern themselves, to the very anarchic uh, uh, liberty of the backcountry, where every backcountryman wanted to be free to go his own way. And there were various other shades and, and variants on, on that theme. And I think what the, the center of all my work is my feeling, which came to a Marylander, a border state between North and South. I have ancestors who fought on both sides and my namesake, um, Josiah Hackett, was a locomotive engineer for the B&O Railroad who got shot by both sides in the Civil War. And uh, <laughs> so we have that diversity in my, in, in my, in my family and, and, and know it well. But it is that diversity in America, which is also a diverse set of ideas of what liberty and freedom fundamentally means. And that's what keeps us free. It means that no single group of people with any particular idea of freedom can tyrannize over all the others. And I think that's how we have survived uh, through all these generations since our founding. All right. Well, thank you, sir. That's, um, those are some tremendous insights. And uh, if that doesn't get people interested in reading the book to, to get the rest of the story, I, I'm not sure what will. But let's get, to, uh, let's get to our compatriot questions. So I'm going to ask the question. I'll identify who asked it, what society they come from. And then Dr. Fisher will answer it, and then we'll move on to the next. So our first question comes from Cliff Olson of the Missouri Society. And he states that I have learned recently that my ancestor, Abraham Piercy, and Governor Yeardley, bartered supplies for a ship with 20 Angolans in 1619 Jamestown, making them the first slaves in North America. But when I was doing the genealogy, I read that they were made indentured servants, the same as others coming from England in order to pay for their transportation, that it was economic, not race, putting these immigrants into temporary servitude. If that is true, when did slavery as we know it start in the American colonies? Uh, the, the short answer is that our our evidence is is not quite up to the to the question. Uh, we don't entirely know um, uh, when slavery really began in the American colonies. We do know that those Angolans, who were the first people to appear in the in the written records, um, were were not referred to as slaves. Uh, we don't know what their status uh, was. Uh, slaves were at that time very uncommon in England. There were a few, but very, very few. Um, and it's, it, it generally thought that they were not at, at the very start enslaved because Britain had very, these British colonists had very little experience of, of slavery. They were, they were almost certainly put into some sort of bondage of one kind or another. And um, uh, they were probably more like indentured servants at the outset. Um, uh, maybe, or let's say servants without indentures. Uh, and slavery slowly took form, uh, not really founded in a formal way, but just slowly growing. What happened was that these uh, newcomers from Africa were treated differently, I think, because they came from a different place, uh, because they came from a different culture, because they looked profoundly different um, from the Europeans who were, who were here. And so they began to be perceived as what we would call a different race. But it took a while for the language of race to form in America. America is older than our idea of race. And so slowly these ideas began to grow. And as they did, as race became, an, became a way of thinking, uh, then they began, these founders began to work out uh, a, a particular kind of um, 
status were people who came from Africa, and that was the origin of slavery. And that developed gradually in the 17th century, and nobody can say exactly when it began, how it began. It was very, very gradual. Much of it was not recorded in any formal way. Um, so we, 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 we cannot be as precise as we would like to be. But then imprecision was at the very heart of all of this. And uh, each colony went its own way. And um, I could talk a little bit uh, uh, about that as, as well. But um, uh, so we, I can say that in, in answer to this first question, when did slavery, as we know, start in the American colonies? It had no single starting year. What it did was slowly to develop. And by the 1640s, clearly slaves were recognized as such. And slavery as an entity began to be legislated in the course of the seven, mid and later 17th century, always by statutes that were unique to each region. All right, well, thank you. Uh, our next question uh, comes from the Kansas Society and uh, Bobby Hulse. Bobby says, what did you find most intriguing about the origins of slavery and were there differing influences on the slave trade based on the different regions of Africa? Uh, that's what we, uh, that's what's the question that was in, in, in my mind and uh, from the start. Uh, and that we had found that uh, that the cultures that came from Europe were, uh, and came from England varied very much with the regions uh, that, that, that from whence they originated. That is, the, the cultures that came to New England uh, uh, came largely from um, Puritans who came from, the predominant flow was from East Anglia in the far eastern part of, of New England. And there were different patterns for every American region, which I lay out in my book on Albion Sea. And then we found that, uh, that uh, different uh, patterns of African origin developed from different flows in the, the slave trade from, uh, from Africa itself. We also found, and I should say we, refers to a large number of historians whose work has been brought together in the American slave database, um, which a group of, of colleagues uh, have founded together and is now entirely online. And it includes um, everything that, get, all the, the major um, um, uh, vital uh, 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 events for every African that they, they have been able to identify uh, in uh, coming to America. And thanks to the computer, now all of this uh, record has been made uh, available to any inquirer it's very easily, the African slave database is very easily accessible. And anybody can ask a question about an individual slave or about slavery in general and can follow it through. It's a great teaching device as well as fundamental to the work of every scholar now who's working uh, in this field. It's, uh, it's an extraordinary uh, achievement. And this has been happening in every field of, of history. It's revolutionizing the practice of history. Uh, and uh, so in this case, slavery in America, African slavery in America, is a case in point for something that's, that, that is working in the history of every nation um, uh, today. And um, did, did the slave trade make a difference? Yes, and it did mainly by concentrating the origins of slaves in, every, in the regions in different ways in every region. So that the, the the New England pattern that came largely from Ghana and Nigeria, uh, mainly from Ghana, was very different from uh, what uh, what went to um, the slaves that came mainly from Angola uh, in, to, in the south. And so we can see that. Uh, in, in, I won't go into detail for all the regions. It's laid out in great in. in in its complexity in, 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 in my book. But again, the main thing is complexity, diversity, as a key to pluralism, to many different cultural groups in America, different 
Afro-American cultural groups, different in their African origins, different in the American regions, different in the European origins of their of, of their of, of the, the the people who who uh, uh, first owned them, and th th those differences are the basis of American pluralism today. Well, I think that's uh, that's a great answer, and I think that African slave database might be a true. Uh, true boon for folks who are working on uh, African genealogy. Oh, for sure. Yes. Because a lot of our, a lot of folks that would like to join and a lot of folks that have the heritage to join have trouble finding the documentation. So yes. this is, this is a good thing to know. So thank you. Uh, next question is from Roger Williams of the New Jersey Society. And Roger says, describe the pure, describe Puritan New England's relationship with slavery? Well, it was a very troubled relationship. The, the, the Puritans who founded New England brought with them a, a culture that was perhaps, uh, I'd say it might have been something like 80% uh, um, um, English and 20% and Puritan. <laughs> and they came mostly from the eastern parts of New England, which uh, from the eastern parts of England, um, which included the counties of Essex, Suffolk, and Norfolk. This is this is what's called East Anglia. It's north. It, it's east and, 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 and northeast of London. And this is a very interesting region. It's a region in which the towns are highly developed, and the towns from an early date, particularly in the central part of this region, the Stour Valley, uh, which was the, the, the core of it. Um, these these towns had town meetings, and when these these uh, these they also were very quick um, to join the F Protestant Reformation, and they became leaders in the Puritan uh, um, um, the, the Puritan churches in in, in, in Old England, and then uh, when Anglicans uh, began to persecute them, they they sought refuge by founding their own colonies. Uh, first in Massachusetts, first at, at Plymouth, then in Massachusetts Bay, uh, and then spreading uh, to other parts of Massachusetts, and then uh, to Rhode Island, uh, to Connecticut, New Hampshire, and founded much of New England. Uh, the the uh, western part of Vermont came mostly up the Hudson Valley from, from, uh, from New Netherlands, but uh, New England began this way. And it began with, uh, with a very particular uh, Puritan culture, uh, a, a, a culture of small towns, of town meetings, of self-government through town meetings that was shaped largely by the culture of the region in England from whence they came, and also by uh, the, the, the quality of their, of, of, their, of their faith as well. And that's what made New England what it has become today, a region like that. And I could go through that in great detail for every other region in America, though I would think your readers might find it more uh, 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 less painful to read the book than to hear me summarize it here. <laughs> uh, but suffice to say that uh, each, each, um, each American region had a, a similar process of development, but always different and in each case unique in the substance of what went on there, from from Puritan New England to Dutch New York to Quaker the Quaker colonies of the Delaware to Cavalier Virginia and Maryland and so forth and so on. All right, um, our next question um, is a slight variation on that. I think it's it's um, it's a question that the answer to is in the book but I will let you address it. It's, this is from Court Dwyer of the Maine Society, who asks, by major percentages, what were the original African countries or Caribbean nations that slaves arrived from when entering North America before, during, and after the revolution? Yes, well, the percentages varied within each region. And the numbers are all in my uh, book, but uh, suffice to say that um, uh, in um, uh, 
uh, in, in, uh, in New England, the slaves came mainly um, uh, from uh, the African countries along the coast of Ghana, parts of Nigeria, but mostly in that, in that area. Uh, and um, uh, that, was, uh, that was a very distinctive core of the, of, 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 of the, of the origins. And then um, in, um, in, 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 these are very complicated stories, but let me say in, in, New, in New Netherlands, what happened was that the slaves came first from Angola, then in the middle part of the history, colonial history, they came from other parts along the coast who were rather more diverse, and then later came from Angola again. But there was a very strong Angolan predominance so in in uh, in, uh, in in that in that region. Uh, in um, in each in each of these. Uh, uh, do you want me to go through every every colony? I think you could say that in each of these in each of these uh, uh, regions, uh, there was a different uh, 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 pattern, but always there was a similarity in the dynamics of it. Uh, there mm -hmm. were there were small African groups that predominated in every region, uh, and even in subregions, and the result was that the Africans who came, even as they often came in chains and as individuals, met other Africans with whom they could communicate in America. And they could begin to build African cultures in America early on in that process, but they built different African cultures from one region to another, depending on where they came from. And my book tries to follow it through the slave databases, through all the quantitative data to find out just exactly where they did come from and to get clues as to um, the cultures that they were be beginning to build uh, in, in, um, in, in, in America. And you'll find the exact proportions um, in, in the tables that are in, in, in the book. All right, well, thank you. And that, that reinforces what, what I saw in reading the book, that there is a tremendous amount of research, a tremendous amount of data in those tables and in those uh, sections where you can. And, and let me add one, one sentence to that. That was, there was, in addition to all of that, there was also um, a tremendous diversity, but there was also um, a certain uh, concentration of collective small groups of, with, of collective African cultures in these, in, in all these places, which allowed some African cultures to, to to, 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 to survive in the new world. I think it's important to get that. It allowed them to, to have that to happen at the same time that it made it happen in many different ways at once. Mm -hmm. All right. Our next question is uh, from Bobby Hulse again of the Kansas Society. Bobby says, in your extensive research into the differences in origin of those enslaved areas of enslavement, types of slavery and other variables, how do you feel your work will impact the current black community, the school of thought in teaching early American history? And most importantly, will it be acknowledged as an upgrade to what is now the accepted truth? Well, um, here's my experience of working with my colleagues over about 60 years. Uh, the first response is to a new idea is always you're crazy. The second response is I knew that all along <laughs> and it takes a little <laughs> while for that to happen. So we will find that there will be initial resistance to any sort of new pattern. People don't like new patterns. They want to stay with the patterns that they've always known. But then they begin to think about it and they begin to study the evidence. And as they do, uh, people begin to, um, uh, begin to in engage. And all of this is a story of complexity but also with a kind of unity. The, the unity is that most Americans have an experience of complexity in their own lives. And they're, they're, they become more or less, um, uh, I won't say they'll become comfortable with it, but they're able to live with it, to work with it, to, to, to make a life out of it. And that's what Americans have been doing. Uh, so they've been working at, uh, working within that diversity without diminishing it. Uh, and with, uh, with uh, and without letting it fragment their own purposes, 
uh, but, but accepting pluralism as a fundamental fact of American life and building on that to make it a continuously free and open system. The key to American history is that it's a free and open system, and I hope it can long remain that way. There are also, there are, there have always been people who've been opposed to open systems, who don't like it, it's uncomfortable for them. They want to shut it down a little bit, but it's important we keep it open. And because that's what keeps us free. Yeah, I think it's important that in, in our environment that people read and continue to educate themselves because if you you stay in your comfort zone and you stay and you only read things that reinforce what you already think then you're entrenching yourself and you're you're closing yourself to to the other things the other cultures the other uh, ideas that are out there yeah and what i'm trying to do uh, is to um encourage people to take an interest in the other others around them, uh, to be uh, to take an interest in the diversity of the people around them, and as they do that, as they live with these diverse people, I think they become more comfortable with that, and that that becomes critically important to the to the maintenance of this free and open system. Thank you. Our, our next question is from Larry Josephowski. Uh, he's a regular uh, contributor to our series. Uh, he's a member of the Delaware Society. And Larry's question is, were there any African Americans who were able to contribute financially to the Revolutionary War cause? And if so, did it have an impact on how they were seen in society? Well, I would say that most of Amer African Americans contributed to the Revolutionary War cause. Um, or to, or, or uh, I think maybe two thirds of them contributed to the to the to to the movement for the revolution. One third of them contributed to the movement against it. They they associated with the loyalists, uh, who were very interesting people as well. And um, but they were they were on both sides of 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 all of that, and uh, and participated very actively in the American Revolution. Um, uh, were there Af any African Americans who, who contributed financially to the Revolutionary War cause? I would say that depending on what you mean by financially, nearly all of them contributed to the war cause in one way or another. They contributed materially to it. Were there any major financial financiers uh, who were African? None to my knowledge. Um, but there were some, there were middling people of middling status who, 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 keep, who did so more than, than others. And um, they, I think they, uh, they, they had a, a considerable role in, in all of that. At the same time, I would say that as two thirds of these Africans probably supported the American Revolution, a good one third, and maybe even a little more, opposed it and, and supported the loyalists. And they did on the other side the same sort of thing. All right. Um, our next question is from uh, Dr. Rudy Bird of the Arizona Society. And it's, it's a fundamental question. I'm going to e expand upon it a little bit. Uh, Rudy's question is, what is the best estimate of the number of African Americans who served in the revolution? Now, I would say he's looking for uh, who served as soldiers, uh, soldiers, sailors, uh, privateers. But I would like you to expand a little bit at this point, because we are the sons of the American Revolution, and uh, this is a question about the war. Specifically, if you have any, um, any stories or any personalities or anything um, relating to um, particular soldiers or like the uh, Delaware Regiment, if you could expand a little bit on their history and contributions to well, the war. Well, I would say, first of all, I don't have very precise numbers on this. Um, and I don't think I could put a number on, on it with any accuracy uh, at the present time. But I would say that the numbers that are given um, by this, by Rudy Bird here, 
uh, should be switched for North and South. He says that he thinks that up to one fifth in, 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 in the North were uh, American soldiers uh, in, in the North and one tenth in the South. And I think it might have been the reverse in New England. I think that New England may have had the smallest, smallest number of Africans with some exceptions in Rhode Island. There would have been virtually no Africans in, the, in, in, in New Hampshire or in, in, in much of Massachusetts in, in those areas, rather more in Connecticut and, 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 and Rhode, Rhode Island. So I would, I, I, I would, so I would, I would reverse the, his one in five for, in, in, to, uh, to, the, to the, in, in the North and, and one in 10 in the South and switch those in, 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 in South and North. So that I think the, the proportion in New England was much, was much uh, smaller than it would have been in, 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 in places uh, further uh, to the south and uh, um, 700. I don't know. That's not that might, something like that might turn out to be right for Valley Forge, but it's a guess and uh, and who knows what the what the what the what the exact answer would be. I think that might be a, a, a reasonable uh, a, a reasonable uh, guesstimate. I would say at the but more of a guess than an estimate. What about the uh, the contributions of the Rhode Island Regiment? Well, those are they are very interesting, and they are and also very diverse within Rhode Island. Uh, but we had we had some we had we had a battalion that was almost entirely African American from 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 Rhode Island, and it had a very distinguished career in the in the war, and became famous in the in in the, in, the, in the revolution. Then there were other units that had very few Africans in them, and it varied that way from one from one to another. All right, thank you. Our next question, uh, our next two questions actually, are from members of the Indiana Society. Uh, first, from Jacob Vink, uh, what is the key regional difference that distinguished the lives of free and/or enslaved Africans in Revolutionary America? Uh, the, uh, the, the major regional differences um, that just distinguished um, these lives, in, I would say that maybe the uh, enslaved Africans in the southern regions had more experience of plantation slavery. Uh, they were held in larger units, uh, which meant um, that they had much more um, to do with other Africans uh, than, than in New England. In, in, in New England uh, and New York, uh, especially in New England, uh, slaves would have been held in, in much smaller units and would have lived with much larger numbers of Europeans. Uh, and so I think we find that African cultures have tended to persist much more powerfully in the Southern colonies than in the Northern ones. An example would be the Gullah cultures of low country, South Carolina and Georgia. And in some of those areas, the cultures were very predominantly African. I have examples in my book of one, 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 one um, island off that coast on which there was only one European who lived there. All the rest were Africans. Were Africans. Uh, so there was 99% of that population was African. Uh, and in, along the Gullah coast, it was a very high predominance of Africans, very different from New England, and then a gradation as we went from north to south. All right. Uh, the next question from uh, Dallas Barkman of the Indiana Society is, is sort of multi-tiered. So I will, I will read the introduction and then uh, the questions, and then you can answer those as... Uh, as it flows. Uh, my ancestor, Jeremiah Duval, had a servant named Mingo. He was an African prince sold to traders by other Africans. He remained with my ancestor when he moved from Maryland to Pennsylvania for the Pennsylvania land or the Penn land grants. My ancestor was a physician in the war and he and Mingo are buried in the same cemetery. What well, role may Mingo have had in the war alongside a physician? First question. 
Second question, we believe Mingo was given the option to stay with my ancestor, Jeremiah Duvall, upon the move to Pennsylvania. What options might he have had if he had stayed in Maryland? And what might the consequences have been if he had stayed? And what might Mingo and others in similar situations remain loyal to their owners, even though they may have had the option to start a new life? Well, let me say to all of this that uh, uh, these are very good questions that uh, uh, Dallas Parkman is asking of me, but it would make more sense for me to ask them of Dallas Parkman, because these are questions that have to be answered from the evidence such as we have uh, for, for these slaves. And we, have, we, should be, we should be looking for clues in the, in the fragments that survive about them. And I don't know what they would be. We'd have to, we'd have to study the evidence very, very carefully. And then, and, and then look, and I could, but I would say, I would go into it and talk a little bit about, say, what role may Ming, what might Mingo have had in the war alongside a physician? And I say, we do have evidence of other uh, slaves of other physicians. And we know that they often worked very closely together. And that a, 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 a slave of a physician became something of a med medical practitioner in his own right. And they would have worked together in various ways. I think that was very commonly the case. And it varied a whole lot depending on the nature of that relationship. Some of them would have been uh, it, it, it virtually um, um, uh, working on a footing that would begin to, through the years, approach not equality, but a much more um, uh, 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 even flow of back and forth of things. Others uh, that would have been a very different relationship in which the, the slave would have remained at a distance from his owner in some degree. But I think in most cases, these uh, physicians who had slaves who worked very closely with them often made their slaves into um, physician's assistants uh, who were in some sense practicing medicine in, 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 in some ways. Others would have gone in a very different direction, but I think uh, it, it, it varied a lot uh, that way. And then um, the, the, the second part of, this, of, of his question was about um, what options Mingo would have had if he had stayed in, in, in Maryland when he was given an, uh, an option uh, to do that or to move to Pennsylvania. And I would say that it varied a lot uh, depending on which way he would have chosen. I think slaves were often given this choice and particularly later in the 18th century as, as masters began to give their slaves increasing amounts of freedom and slowly moving them toward freedom in some ways. Uh, that they would have uh, been uh, been given more um, more options where they were, but all of this was a broad range of possibilities, and it varied a lot depending on the nature of that relationship uh, between the master and the slave, and how it changed uh, uh, through through time. We know that some of these slaves uh, preferred to stay in Maryland when they were given an opportunity to move to freedom. Others went. I think most of them preferred to go to freedom. The great majority wanted to be free, but it depended on their relationships with others. Uh, and that was a story of great variation from one, one person to another. All right. Yeah, I think a lot, of, a lot of those decisions were probably based on how well one was treated and how yeah. what personal relationships existed. Uh, our next question comes from the uh, outreach education staff, uh, and the qu question is, what avenues can we use to work towards the inclusion of African American contributions into discussions taking place in our current society? Uh, well, I think um, uh, my colleagues, um, I, let, me, let me say I can talk with more confidence about um, what avenues are being used uh, to work towards in, the inclusion of African American contributions um, into discussions of what's taking place in our current society, and there a, a lots going on here. People are many of my colleagues are working on project, uh, projects that are related to all of this, and they do it in 
in many different ways. And I think uh, uh, some of them are, are stressing the um, autonomy of African-Americans and uh, their, their, their increasing independence and drawing on their own experience. Others are stressing their interaction with uh, European Americans and the way in which they changed American culture in general. And so it can go in both of those very different, uh, uh, they, both of those very different avenues. Uh, and a lot of work is being done in, 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 all, in both, all those ways. All right, thank you. Uh, next question up, uh, Shane James of the International Society asks, in your research, mm -hmm. was there one African founder that stood out above the rest for his personal story? If no, was there one common character trait or attribute that you found in those individuals whose stories made an impression on you? Uh, the answer to the first is uh, no, there was no one African-American who stood out. There were so many of them, and my book is a is a is a is a, a, a multi multi biography of many many Africans in America, uh, and uh, I, I I certainly would not want to single out any person at the at the top. The amazing thing was how broad uh, the, the 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 history was, how many interesting people there were who emerged through all of this and how diverse they were in what they did. First of all, they were both men and women uh, and the female slaves uh, were often quite as interesting as the male slaves in, in, in what they did in, and in, 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 in what came of all of that. And uh, it was the same as we, as we go through all the other ways in which you can think about people. Again, it's a story of vast uh, diversity and, and many, many different voices here. And uh, American history is increasingly a history of multiple voices in which African voices are increasingly heard. And that's a large part of what my book is about. I try to, in my book, to get Africans speaking about the history that I'm writing and African-Americans. And a large part of my book is it, it, it comes from them directly. And there are hundreds, even thousands of people in the pages of the book who were like that. And it's the incredible range and variety of this, which is more important than any single individual. All right. Uh, next up, another question from Roger Williams of the New Jersey Society. What role did organized religion play in either the abolition or propagation of the institution of slavery? It, 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 religion was profoundly important in early America and on both sides of the question. So the churches were always involved. The denominations were always involved and they were involved very differently. And uh, we have some who were um, the New Englanders, I think, uh, um, it, it were, were, were moved, were the first to move against slavery uh, in many ways, along with the Quakers, the new, the, both the, the, the Quakers and the New England. I say the, the Quakers came later, uh, but then moved even more powerfully uh, to oppose slavery. Uh, they became, the, the group, they, um, they, they, they contributed more to the anti slavery movement leadership. Than than other uh, other uh, 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 other police, others other, others did, and um, uh, it, uh, um, uh, it 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 was uh, again it's a story of, 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 of I don't know what to add to all of that, but there were, there are many different groups doing many different things. So what can I say? And the, my book goes region by region, and answers that question for every region, and the answers are never never the same. All right. Um, next question, also from Roger, has to do with uh, a specific region. Uh, he says, in reading African founders, I was surprised to read just how long it took for slavery to be abolished in the middle states. With respect to slavery, how did the middle states seem to get a pass in the national consciousness? Yes, I, I was a little bit surprised at that as well. I think that uh, maybe what was extraordinary was that uh, New England moved so much more quickly than others. Uh, and it, it, partly because there was a, a, 
a, a, a, a much a, 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 a deeper a culture of um, of, of, of social engagement in, in the in, in the institutions of New England uh, than than was the case in some other places. But the Quakers were were right up there as well in in, in the Delaware Valley. So the the two together, uh, the the Dutch lag, lagged behind in that regard. Things went more slowly in the Hudson Valley uh, because of of that of the of that that process. So uh, that's that's. Uh, uh, and and, and uh, so it was. Um, it, it, I think that, that th those were major factors uh, in in de 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 determining the speed with which all of this proceeded. All right, uh, our last two questions come from Tom Jackson of the Texas Society, uh, and Tom's first question is uh, states that W. E. B. Du Bois wrote. Few men ever worshipped freedom with half such unquestioning faith as did the American Negro for two centuries. Is his statement supported by your research? Yes, absolutely. I think that uh, that uh, I think uh, uh, people who had uh, who had known slavery or who had descended from slaves had a particular urgency. In their in their quest for freedom, so for sure, I'm sure. I think that's uh, that's very very true. I would I would uh, I, I would absolutely agree with W. D. B. Du Bois, as I always call it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the, Tom's next question is uh, says Professor and author Sandra E. Green noted that slavery in the United States ended in 1865 but legally continued in West Africa for another 10 years and unofficially for decades longer. She also proposes that slavery in Africa was not racial, but of kinship. Did the culture, cultural differences in the foundation of slavery impact democracy and freedom differently? Is it conceivable that slaves imported into the United States were aware of these differences? Uh, well, I think that, um... That the first part of this question is 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 is, is, is clearly correct. That is that uh, that slavery did continue um, in Africa long after it ended in the United States, um, and there are some there there is actually uh, people keep turning up instances of bondage uh, persisting even to our to our own time in some in, in some remote remote places, and I think that's. Uh, that's certainly uh, that's certainly true, and I think it is also true that slavery in Africa was not racial, uh, and that she said it was it was a, a, a more of kinship. And I think that was true, but uh, you could add something else. It was uh, uh, that there was there, there was no race slavery there, but that there was a, a enslavement of people who for, were, came from other cultures in Africa uh, and that, that sort of thing. And so, um, so there is, a, 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 but that, that the, 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 after the slavery developed, often there was a more kinship that emerged between the, the slave and free in Africa than in, in, in America. I think that's, uh, that's, that's true. And uh, I, I'm not sure that, um, the, 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 these uh, these cultural differences uh, impacted to democracy and freedom differently. Um, I, I and I, I I I don't know about his last question, but I think the rest of it I I think is is very clear and very interesting. Yeah. So. All right. Well, that that's the end of our questions. Um, I'd like to uh, read an extract from your book to wrap up the. Uh, our interview today. Uh, and page 720 of the book, uh, racism in its infinite variations will always exist in America and elsewhere. But to condemn the United States as a racist society is fundamentally false. It misses the successful efforts of 12 generations of Americans, and especially the role of the Africans born in slavery and the children of slaves in enlarging fundamental American rights in New England and through the United States during the 18th and 19th centuries. To overstate the negatives in American history is to miss its positive achievements and its central dynamics. 
Um, I'll give you an opportunity, sir, if you would like to make any closing comments. Uh, and I'd well, like very much that, to that's very much that, to thank that, you for taking the I time to talk to us today. It's, it, I think is I think that it's profoundly uh, important in the work that, in my understanding of my own work, I think this is exactly what I've been about. I think that first of all, uh, I think that something's gone right in America, even as many things have gone wrong. I think the main thing has gone right in that we are still a republic that is founded and devoted to liberty and freedom. And I, I think that is absolutely fundamental to what makes America what it is today. And the question is, how did we get there and how can we keep it going? And I think the answer is that we, it, it arises in large part from our diversity and that we can keep it going by being tolerant of diversity at our own time. I think that's the key uh, to being a country of liberty and freedom. Well, thank you, sir. Um, folks, this is the book. Um, it is a wonderful read. It is educational. It is more details than you probably ever uh, anticipated uh, could be out there. But it's a, it's a, I highly recommend it, and I think it would uh, be time well spent. I'd like to thank you, sir, for talking to us today, and look forward to uh, look forward to your next work. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. Thank you.